So hello, Harvey. How are you doing? Hello, Lucas. I'm doing very well. How are you? Yes, I'm. I'm great. And uh, yes, yeah, so it's uh, it's great to have you here uh, on my show. I uh, just want to do a little shout out to uh, Mabel Gomez who uh, suggested you as a candidate uh, because of uh, I think of all the things you were doing with Tango Online uh, and. Uh, um yeah you became friends and well i'm happy always happy uh, when people uh, suggest uh, someone for an interview so um whoever's watching if you have uh, or you harvey of course if you have a suggestion for me you know if you want to refer something uh, someone uh, i'm always glad to uh, to invite uh, those people as well um but for now uh, our today's guest is harvey I think he has a lot of interesting things to say about tango and uh, well um, actually I would first like to ask you like I always do like can you tell us a bit uh, about yourself like a bit of a general introduction uh, especially for people who don't know you yes of course I'd love to but first I'd like to echo the shout out to Mabel Gomez thank you Mabel and uh, uh, thank you Lucas I'm very happy to be here and have this opportunity so a little bit about myself. I was born in New York City. That's why I speak the way I do. Yeah, I kind of kind of figured. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I moved to the Washington, D.C. area in uh, 1984. Uh, I started dancing tango in 2011. And since then, I've participated in various tango events in uh, North America, uh, in Europe, predominantly in Italy and in Buenos Aires. I've organized some tango events, generally small ones, not recurring. I've DJed at Milongas, uh, marathons, tango retreats, house parties, special celebrations. And I've uh, had a professional career as a research economist and methodologist, but DJing has become my passion. And uh, I love dancing too, but DJing is really more of my passion. Um, and I find that dancing and DJing has um, brought a lot of joy in my life. And it's helped me to forge relationships with interesting people locally as well as all over the world. So that's a bit about myself. Well, that's very interesting. And sorry to interrupt you there, but what's, um, did you say you like DJing more than dancing? Well, it, it, it's, I didn't say I, I like it more, but it's really more my passion. Um, the music, because I'm focused even, it might evolve as one and the same as with dancing, but that I'm not clear about. So when I DJ, I focus very much on the music and all the people that are, that are dancing. I also, when I dance, I do consider the Rhonda and navigation and the other people. But when I DJ, I feel as though I'm giving something to other people and I'm sharing moods and maybe inviting people um, to a better place. And um, I think that's something that drives me generally. Now, certainly with dancing, I try my best to be responsive to the partner responsive to the to the music and do the same kind of thing but i think because in a more let's say general or global way i'm focused on this giving and trying to bring people to a better place when i dj and i'm excited about learning the music i see myself as a student of the music um it becomes more of a passion but dancing is something that is now in my blood even though it didn't start that way and I love it too. So that's the best way I can describe it. Okay. So it was more about the passion than perhaps than uh, maybe preferring something. It's more like you 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 enjoy giving something yes. to. Well, actually, I have the I have the same uh, thing, especially nowadays. I feel like when I'm DJing, I can actually serve someone in some way. While I'm dancing, it's just for myself mostly. Even though it's a social dance, and you're dancing with your partner, you're partner is i mean supposedly at least having fun with you um that's 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 great but it's it's even better if you can uh, you know um if you have this social role in a way and it's something we don't really have in our normal lives right 
Yes, exactly. And that's one thing among many that tango is wonderful about is the social aspect and being able to socialize. And um, without going too deep into that, also it's a way of, for me, of learning more about myself and how others see me. And um, so it's a microcosm of life, but it really helps you to focus a lot on yourself, your own development and your interactions with other people. Good, good. So it's a, it's a joy, and in, in both in the dancing and in the DJing for me. Yes, yes. Well, we'll most likely talk more about that later. But um, that's uh, that wasn't an expected, uh, profound uh, start. But that's uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's totally fine. Uh, that's well welcome, actually. Um, but it's just to stick to the to the how I planned the questions. Uh, um, like how, how did you start uh, with tango? How did you become interested in the music? Something like that. How okay. that that will be might take a little while. But let me just um, say initially that I started in a surprising way becoming interested in tango, and I developed my interest and my tango slowly but surely. And so more specifically, I, my initial interest in tango was sparked by a fortune teller. And how did that happen? Okay, well, so um, this might have been around 2009, could be off by half a year or a year. Um, and I had been divorced for a while. And um, it was around Halloween time, which is a big celebration in the United States. Um, and my daughter, who was about 12 or 13 at the time, uh, was in middle school. And I took her and two of her friends to what I'll call um, a haunted house and a haunted park. So they, I, there is a certain term for it, but it escapes me. And so in some places, this was in a semi-rural area, they have um, people dressed up in all sorts of scary costumes and it's dark and you might go on a hayride with a slotted wooden uh, enclosure and, uh, and people will come out of the bushes and sort of poke you and scream and all that. And then there's a haunted house and uh, at the end, uh, near the end, there's even somebody with a chainsaw that chases you <laughs> after you go through, but no one's been injured or anything like that. So I went and I went through all this with them and it takes, you know, 20 minutes or something and it's pretty scary, but it's kind of fun. And I felt, okay, this was good, being a good dad and, and these kids are loving it and they like the fact that I did all this with them but they want to do it eight or nine times. And one time was enough for me. And so I said, you know, I'm going to go over. I notice there's a place to sit and there's some other events going on. I'm going to sit there, knock yourselves out, go as many times as you want. I'll be here and drive you back, et cetera. So when I walk over to this area, I noticed I was working really long hours, very hard. And I noticed there's a place for apple cider, which I like, and a place selling freshly baked oatmeal cookies. That was so exciting to me. I said, oh, I'm going to really just enjoy myself. I'm going to sit down, eat these oatmeal cookies, drink the cider, and just relax, breathe, and, you know, look at some people, watch people. But then I see in the distance that there's this fortune teller and this tar and a tarot card reader, and there's a line. And I re had reflections of one time when I went to a fortune teller many years ago when I was in graduate school working also very, very hard. But I'm scientific. I don't believe that they know the future. They know, they don't believe that they know exactly what's going on. But what I did learn the first time was that they know how to read your vital signs. They can pick up from your body language, from your breathing. They, if they're really good, they read all this into you. So the first thing, I've never seen her again, that the fortune teller asked me when she's reading my palm and she says, who holds you? And I said, well, sometimes my daughter hugs me, you know, and she says, well, have you been doing anything with your hands, either spiritually or some kind of exercise? And I said, no, I've been 
you know, I like that. Um, I was thinking of sculpting, you know, but, uh, you know, I'm not that interested. She said, have you ever tried Argentine tango or Tai Chi? <laughs> and I said, no, I, I haven't. And I, I didn't even know what Argentine tango was. <laughs> you know, I, you know, is that, you know, where the, the guy is throwing the woman all around and she has a rose, you know, sticking out of her mouth or something, you know, and um, so, we had more talks about that. She talked a little bit about that. And I thought about each of them, Tai Chi and, and Tango. But I'm pretty mm, conservative and I really have to think it's something good for me and I have to understand it more. So I did a little bit of Googling and reading and a half a year or so passes by and I'm at um, a much younger cousin's graduation party from college. And another cousin is there who's in medical school. Currently, she's a child psychologist, and she, but she was a dancer. And on my father's side of the family, there are quite a number of dancers, but she had been thinking about going professional as a ballerina, and she did ballroom, she did some tango. She said, Harvey, you know, you're not going out and socializing, you know, and you should try Argentine tango. And there are a lot of interesting people with substance. You would like it, you would enjoy it. It's a walking dance. You, and she showed me some things. You don't have to be a ballerina. You don't have to be, you know, you can enjoy this socially. And again, I thought about it more, I Googled some more, and then I said, uh huh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to try Argentine tango and then I'm going to try Tai Chi. And I said, okay, if I'm going to try Argentine tango, I know nothing really about it. I'm going to buy a pair of dancing shoes. So when I go to the lesson, you know, I'll have the shoes and I won't have to, you know, be in street shoes or whatever. So I go to this store called Repeat Performance, which doesn't exist anymore, which a lot of dancers go to. And the, the, the manager of the store, you know, helps me buy the shoes. He says, oh, do you do tango? I said, no, but I want to learn. He says, well, when do you want to learn? I want to learn real soon. And I said, but and he said, well, where? I said, somewhere, you know, in this local area would help me. So he said, okay how about next door? Cause that's where I have my studio. And, um, but I said, I want to learn real soon. He says, how about tomorrow night at 7 15? I said, okay. And so that's how I first started. But essentially um, the first um, few teachers that I was with for a few times, I, I learned some things, but I didn't feel like I, I listened to the music and I said, this music is beautiful. This, there's something about dancing to this music that, would be flowing that would relate to the music. And I'm feeling like I'm taking a step, why I'm taking a step here, take a step there, take a step there, turn like this, but where's the music? Where is this relationship to the music? And so for the first couple of years, I was learning, but not a lot. I didn't feel for what I needed, but I always learned something from all the, from any instructor. And then um, one day um, I'm at a practica. And I'm trying to learn and I keep on finding different instructors. And then I see, you know, people at the practica and I, I dance a little bit while well, called dancing, so-called dancing at that point. And uh, I see this one woman, you know, dancing around and leading and following. She's different than the other people. She's definitely different than the other people. And then this one friend who's in some classes with me, who's been dancing for, you know, like 10, 11 years, more than my two or two or whatever it was at the time, who's a really good dancer, I said to him, you know, where have you, where have you learned? Where have you learned? You know, where are there students that go to an instructor and they go to Malangas and the instructor goes to Malangas sometimes as opposed to just taking lessons and learning how to do this and do that. And he says, you see that woman over there? And I said, yes, I've been watching her. She was my in instructor. Her name was Eugenia Park, who used to be partners with Chen Park for Zen Tango. And I said, boy, I'd really love to take lessons with her. And so he connected me with her. And I was so fortunate at the time because she was in a partnership with Barbara Dorr, who really good Mulungero, who leads and follows. And I started taking lessons with them and going to practicas and, they, uh, and going to their workshops and from privates with them. And they became my North Star. And then I, I learned um, about other instructors through them, like Susanna Miller, and I took lessons with her and Maria Plazola that I learned from uh, learned about from uh, Susanna Miller. And then I was introduced to Brigitte Winkler, who is absolutely the most amazing teacher 
I think of any kind of teaching that goes on as well as dancer. And, and there, there are others, there's many others. And I started to feel their passion and I became very passionate about it. So I started with a surprise. I, I also picked up the Tai Chi and did, you know, was practicing with that in a, in a serious community where, you know, 98% of the people were um, Chinese and everything was, was, was taught in, China, in Chinese. And so oh. at some point I had to make a, a decision um, for me, given how many, much I was working, that it was either Tai Chi or, or tango. I'm being kind of rushing through this now, maybe. And I decided on tango, but I incorporate some Tai Chi exercises and what I do to help improve my uh, dancing. And um, I could fill in anything that you want, but that, that's basically how it started. It started as a surprise, really slow, and then it picked up. And a lot of it was because I found the right people. And I think different people find their way into tango differently. And my, I was just blessed because there were people, uh, one thing I find in common with many of the instructors that I like a lot is they're kind, they're considerate, they're not trying to mold you to dance like them. They're trying, they meet you where you are and they have the ability to see where you are and to help you in your journey. And, and that's what I love. And they're just some, I could go on about each of them in a lot, you know, a lot of depth, but I think this perhaps gives a, a picture of what you were looking for. Yeah, so uh, you're essentially saying that it, it took you some time to find the right instructor. Yes, I mean, that's a, that's a big part of it. Um, so I feel, so I, I feel as though I could learn um, in a way that I can enjoy it and develop. And, um, and I think, you know, in, in part of that, uh, I learned more about myself. Um, oftentimes I've learned, particularly in school settings or when I was teaching, um, by taking copious notes and uh, studying and studying the notes. And then I would feel something and understand it. Uh, but, um, Oftentimes, uh, this is maybe a, a little bit of a digression. You know, when I was a student and I go to a lecture or something like that, one reason I would take notes beyond just trying to learn and make sure that I could be prepared was that my mind, sometimes I would hear something and I would think, well, what if? And, but how does that relate to this? And I would interrupt, you know, what it, my thinking. Uh, in terms of being focused on what the professor might be saying. And so I would take the notes to sort of stay, stay on top of things. And then I would go back to my notes. And some of the, some of the teachers would say, okay, Harvey, why don't you write this down, you know, after the lesson, why don't you take notes about, you know, what we discussed or something. And, and that would help. And that generally does help. Before I took notes, um, didn't have to be you know, while the lesson was going on, but capturing the essence of things in my own words after the lesson would help me a lot. And uh, instructors encouraged me to do that. That's not the only way I've learned. There, mm, there are some ways I've learned that are mysterious to me. Like um, the first time I went to um, a tango retreat in Italy um, that Brigitte Winkler um, led, you know, I was wondering, what am I learning? You know, and I understood something about body awareness and I, don't, and I was thinking, you know, because it was different than what I was exposed to about learning kind of movements. And uh, it was not quite so focused on learning movements, even though there was some of that. And I was said, you know, I feel so good, but I don't know about my dancing. And then within uh, the first several weeks after I return, I'm dancing back locally and you know, people saying your dancing has got so much better, and I, I, you know, and but I can't explain it. I cannot explain it whatsoever. But of co of course, she's a great she's a great teacher. But I have no clue how that happens. Uh, so uh, it's one thing that I love about um, tango that there's some things that you really can't explain in in words, um, and that's wonderful for me. Um, so you also took private lessons? Oh, yes. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. How, how many, like, uh, 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 what is the, 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 the rate, so to say, the, the ratio between uh, 
Well, that's a good uh, between privates and groups. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I would say that Barbara Dorr and Eugenia Park have been my North Star. Unfortunately for me, in one sense, Barbara Dorr had uh, has relocated um, to Asheville, North Carolina. Mm. From um, I have visited her. She's a wonderful person. But they had a great partnership. But you know, life changes take place, and sometimes. Um, uh, people move away. But for quite a few years, um, I would take, let's say for at least a few years, I would take privates with them on the average, I'd say the average of three a month for a few years. And they had workshops once a month um, for about nine or 10 months out of the year. And I would take almost all of the workshops. Uh, and the, the, <clears throat> Well, Barbara had danced with Cacho Dante, and she's sort of what I would call a young old timer. But because uh, when she was very young, she was able to dance with the, the masters, um, you know, the 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 gray beards and and um, and um, has a great teaching style. And Eugenia is just a phenomenal dancer as well. And so they were focused on really teaching people to get their dance, to have their dance. And, and um, so even with the workshops, um, they would have maybe anywhere between four and nine couples on the average. It would vary. And sometimes they would bring in people like Susanna Miller or Brigitte Winkler or Alicia Pons or something like that. And, um, but the workshops were always focused on people, uh, enabling people to move with the music and navigate. And there might be three or four different movements that are related that they would always break down. And if you could capture all four, fine. If you can capture two, fine. Um, you had a chance to change partners and they were always circulating within the group as well as taking turns dancing with some of the people some of the time it was really focused on learning and breaking it down um and then after that there was a chance to practice and there's also a chance to socialize you know with some beverages and cheese and crackers and things like that it was a very relaxing environment people got to know each other and sometimes some of the people would go to the same malangas together so it was really wonderful and helped me a lot. And so uh, I would say that's that. And then with other people, I, I try, if I can take lessons with Brigitte Winkler twice a year, that's fantastic and have an opportunity. Uh, this past uh, year, I was able to have an opportunity to take all her um, group classes at uh, a festival in North Carolina and uh, dance with her during Malangas. And um, a, I think a couple of weeks before that, or a few weeks before that, maybe more, I took one private with her. So, you know, she's quite um, engaged in, in tango and teaching professionals, et cetera, um, but very kind. And uh, she's very knowledgeable. She can, uh, I was so impressed with, um, not just how well she leads and follows and how she teaches, but how she can pick up on things that you can do, seeing what you can do that you never thought of, or just being more improvisational. And if she can lead you in the way that you lead, and then she could lead you with a, in another way. And she say, this is how you lead. This is, this is how you, know, you could lead. But if you, and you know you want, let's say to improve, leading a certain movement or in a certain way. And then as she's following you in a lesson, in real time, she could say, now Harvey, soften that left knee. Now take the step. And then all of a sudden, aha, aha, yeah, 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 yeah. it goes off. And to have that kind of talent and ability and consideration, you know, is phenomenal. So, uh, and, and Susanna Miller, you know, worked me really hard, but, uh, and she, and I've developed a lot through her and her workshops with Maria Plazola. And, um, but I have to say that I always felt as though I was letting her down, but huh. I, and it, it was, I, she was very rigorous and she's really good and she will work hard. And 
uh, teach you, but I felt I was uh, not quite good enough. So, uh, um, but anyway, and there are other teachers. And so um, the, I, I, I think I get a lot more out of privates than I do from group lessons, but there's some socialization for group lessons. But if I see an instructor that dances in a style that I like, and has something to offer that's similar, somewhat similar to things that I want to do or want to learn, I'll take group lessons. So I take much fewer group lessons than privates. And, I, and currently, I haven't been taking as many privates as I used to um, when Barbara was also here and also pre-pandemic. OK, OK. Yeah, I can't uh, help but um... Admit that I, I tend to have more respect for people who have invested in private lessons, uh, even though, I mean, of course, some people don't have money for private lessons, but I think the average income in Tango is, is pretty high. And I think there's plenty of people who could pay it, but don't really take them. Um, but it's actually the, the best way to learn. And um, yeah, I always I think it's uh, in one way or another, I think it's a good sign if, if someone has actually invested just the time, you know, yes. in, 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 in being serious about uh, chasing this, this, this ideal for yourself, this, this potential. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, a lot of people could benefit uh, from such lessons. Um, let me think, I need to organize my thoughts uh, a bit here. Um, Yeah, I think you. I think you told me before that you had a background in music. Like I, I'm hinting at maybe yeah. a question about how you developed your interest in tango music. But you, you seem to have some done some things before that, uh, right? Yes. Well, um, when I was much younger, I played the trap set, the drums, and some jazz and, and some rock. And um, I had thought about mostly um, informally at parties, but I did play a few times professionally. But um, it was at a point where I had to make a decision uh, about future career. And I saw the possibility about becoming a professional musician if I had a regular day job um, and would still continue to take lessons. I was very fortunate that I had a great uh, teacher, Sonny Igo who was also sort of a young old timer, I think played near the end of Benny Goodman's, you know, big swing days. Mm -hmm. And he became um, the drummer for ABC. So for one of the, uh, the major uh, TV networks of the day. And he also would play sometimes with a, a classical, a philharmonic orchestra, but jazz, like similar to the modern jazz quartet. And he, most of the people that he would teach would come to hit for his lessons once or twice a year because they had their own bands. And uh, I was just, you know, more of a novice compared to, to those people. Um, but I developed and I liked it a lot. And um, I first became interested in music, I think, at a very young age, listening to my father's jazz collection because he liked a lot of jazz. And so as a little child, I would listen to a lot of jazz. And then I liked some popular music and um, played the recorder for a while. But you know, tango music came with learning tango to dance. But somewhat before that, I was in a car with a colleague of mine, and she was playing music. And I said, this is beautiful music. What kind of music is this? And she said, it's Brazilian jazz. And um, what I started to realize is, I had a very myopic view about music. I knew some of classical music, jazz and rock, but what about music from other cultures that were similar? And I, I didn't know that much about it. And so when I heard that the first lesson that I took in tango, the first dance lesson was the first time I was exposed, as far as I can remember, to tango music. And I think this music is beautiful. This music is incredible. Where was I under a rock or something? I liked it immediately. Yeah, yeah. I liked it. I liked it. I liked it immediately, and um, and so you know, I did have some background in music, but this music was special. And then, because of that, I had you know, and then when I started to learn a little bit about the orchestras, I had to read about some of these people because 
you know, some of these musicians, whether they played the violin, the bandoneon, the piano, whatever, the singers, these were not, you know, these were some superstars the way I looked at it, you know, just like from what I was familiar with in jazz or even, you know, like Philharmonic type of, of musicians. And so I started reading about, and then I started learning, oh, these people are real characters. And look, look at how, well, no wonder there's a golden age. And look, look how all these confluence of, of certain factors that contributed to the development of this amazing period of time, this amazing music. So um, uh, the music really got to me. And that was the, sort of a frustration with, in a sense of how I was first learning. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, I had to find my way. And then um, when I saw, gee, this can all come together, the music, the dancing, the people, it's all great, um, but it takes a while. Um, so, you know, having started out as a child with, you know, some music background and in, in school, uh, one of the, a couple of music teachers, when I would just take like a certain kind of appreciation course, I said, you have a vivid imagination because they would play Mendelssohn's Mintz summer night's dream and they said what do you see and i say i see these fairies with the wands you know coming around and going around in a circle and uh there was something about music that would i, I can't explain it that would um just motivate me and stimulate me and also whenever you know so much of the tango is it's so interesting how so many of the songs are so sad but the music the music some of the music could still be upbeat and make you feel you know happy um so um, I just got excited and I had some, like some background, but you know, not a tremendous amount, but I always, but I, li I still listen to jazz and I listen to some rock and classical music. And I try to listen to music from other cultures much more so than I used to when I was younger, because there's so much more to appreciate from all different countries. But you know, certainly in uh, Argentina, uh, it's so amazing to me. You know, I don't know of any of many other cultures where you know, or the country where both mm, the music and dancing are emblem emblemic of, of the of the culture and and you have that in Argentina and even with the folk songs and etc so um I guess um you know the exposure that I had as a child and, and having played an instrument um helped in in my in developing my interest in tango but also just the, the question mark in my head when I first started is, okay, I understand you could do these steps and move in this way. What about the music? What about what I want to learn how to dance? <laughs> that's what, and that's- Wow, that, that's quite an interesting perspective because there, there probably weren't a lot of people, beginners uh, who are now good dancers who, who were necessarily like that when they started because you, you actually, your first, um, instinct was something people usually learn later because on, or at least i mean i have yeah. the idea that a lot of people start dancing tango because of the dance and then later they learn to like the music i actually came the other way around because i liked the music and i thought i couldn't ever learn to dance and then i actually started with some lessons and it was terrible but i i uh, you know i i, I uh, persevered so um in your case, you I think you immediately understood that what you were hearing was actually something that had to dominate what you were doing instead of the other way around. Yes. Or so. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Well, that's that's very that's very interesting. And uh, this question might be a bit redundant, but uh, by now, but what did you like about the music? <laughs> I mean, you have said something about that, but uh, well. Do you mean what do I what did I like about the music without dancing to it, just listening, or what did I like about the music in general and how it might uh, lend itself to what I like in the dancing, or both? Yeah, both. But I, I can't okay, recall. Yeah. I can't recall exactly what you just said about what you thought was so different about this music. I think you said something. That you liked but i can't uh, remember exactly what you said uh, so maybe you can just recap that or, or, or okay well i might not have said something exactly like that but um let me try to recap or and maybe somewhat redirect a bit um so initially what i liked about the music first of all 
I still don't know a lot of Spanish, only a little, and I have to, you know, look carefully for good translations um, for some of the songs. But I, there's, I guess, two general things: is one the musicianship, and two, the um, the emotions that I felt. Listening. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I remember you were saying like these uh, people were superstars. Oh, yeah. Like what I know from jazz. I mean, that, that's what you said. But I, oh, I yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's what I mean by the musicianship, the quality, uh, you know, whether it was solo, uh, the, the arrangements, sometimes mm -hmm. the arrangements, the, the creative use, like, you know, it depends. If it, here's Salamanca, I think violins, you know, and the way he uses the violins. And uh, Darienzo, the bandoneons, even though the piano is sort of the backbone, as he used to say, but you know, the, the arrangements, um, the, the, um, they were, you know, there were sort of classic musical elements in there and jazz. And so listen to Desarly. He was certainly influenced by both classical training and jazz, and I think even more jazz. And so I would hear, some of these things that were familiar, but different, nevertheless, be, okay, you know, because there were no drums in general, unless you're talking about kandambe. So, you know, and I, you, in, in drums, one thing I like about drums is keeping the time. But anyway, but I could feel it from the bandoneons. And so I could relate to the different instruments and the arrangements were, they were, a number of them are very sophisticated, you know, it's not all. But you know, when I listen to Lorenz, I think he's the king of rhythm. So maybe you know, maybe uh, Darienz is the king of the beat. But I think you know, and and I would hear different orchestras, and I would say, you know, you can listen to the same song by by several different orchestras. It's almost like a different song, but it, they're all good, you know. And um, so these are the kinds of things that sort of um, inspired me. And so a lot of times when I first started listening, I said let's say I could recognize the orchestra and then I would start to recognize the singer and I, and I could see the relationship, you know, and how it would change between the singer and the orchestra over time in general, you know, and this was, the whole thing was like, um, you know, this big band, the swing, for example, in jazz, and it's swing, you know, and it stays swing, whether you're playing it in 2019 or you're playing it in 1948, you know, it's still swing. But so there's something about the way the tango music evolves. And, um, and then, you know, starting to listen to some of the same orchestras playing the same uh, songs at different periods of time, why is it different? Well, some of them are developing with the times. Some of them, the musicians have changed. And it was intriguing because some, you know, like Darienzo was playing for so many years, just knowing who's with the orchestra, who, you know, and, and uh, there was something that you know that captivated me because in general history and languages were my weakest areas but for some reason uh history with tango you know fortunately michael lavoke is around and other people you could learn from but because of the i would hear things in the music i was motivated to learn more uh you know about the history and other types of things and because of the arrangements and all the different changes and, and the sophistication and the beauty of the songs, uh, that, that's, you know, really what, what drove me. I think what, what you're essentially saying is that you, or the way I view it at least, is that, that you, you, you went in into this learning process already with a bit of a background, even though you, you, you say it wasn't like really, really pronounced, but you still knew a, a bit about about music you had a, a solid musical background and then when you i always find it quite fascinating that you know someone with no musical education at all can listen to this music and they'll they'll hear much less depth and less layers than you did and you were talking i don't know if you were really talking only about the beginning about how you hear the music but there's quite some sophistication in how you looked at it and uh, also, maybe it was quite natural for you to look at certain things, to think about arrangements or to think about what the instruments were doing or hear actually what the bandoneon was. But I didn't come into this with with uh, with a musical background, even though, uh, yeah, uh, you can learn. And I definitely did. 
but um, it's just very interesting how, how, how someone else has a different perspective on this because they already had that life experience that helped them understand this much faster in a way than some other people. Well, you know, I also learn more as I've listened to more tango music, but, you know, it, beauty is in the, in, they say in the eyes of the beholder, it could also be in the ears of the beholder. Yeah. And for me, it was, the drive was really the beauty of the music and how some of the music, uh, when I first learned, motivated me a lot. When I first learned, mo more of the music that motivated me was more rhythmic and you know up tempo because i was more accustomed to that but in time more and more of the music uh, motivated me to dance and to listen more fully so yes i agree with what you said and that, that captures you know my background a bit and what i said but also i learned along the way but the beauty essentially the way i felt and the way i feel it and perceive it was the main motivator uh, in terms of, you know, the music and listening to the music and that type of thing. Okay, okay. Um... So yeah, that's maybe you've said already, you've told us some things about how you learned tango, but uh, yeah, I'd like to hear a bit more about that. Um, maybe actually that, that's not what I wanted to ask, but just as a confirmation. So at some point you you found this teaching that you could call Milonguero style. Yeah. You felt at home with that. Do you consider yourself a style in that dancer? Uh, uh, sorry, a dancer in that style? Uh, definitely a Milonguero. Um, I wasn't, I, I did seek it out after a while, but initially when I had an exposure to it before I was really seeking it out in the first year or so of dancing, I didn't feel real comfortable with it. Um, but I, but then when I sought it out, um, which took you know a few years, um, which is something I really wanted because I, I was watching people that dance well, but not doing crazy different kinds of strange movements and all sort of legs flying all over no, the place. No, you're not a nuevo guy. That, right, right, right. And <laughs> I've done a little bit of that, but that's the embrace and the connection, uh, the responsiveness with the partner and to the music is the key for me. I mean, that's, it, it's so important, but um, I'm definitely a Milonguero. And um, I guess what I started to learn was that tango is not just about steps. It's not just about movements. And I see it as sort of a, a beautiful and unique way of being open and available to a partner and other people while they at the same time are open and available to you. And it's a source of having fun and enjoying and, uh, and, and socializing. And, um, and like I said, some of that socialization uh, or enhanced socialization was triggered with Barbara and, and Eugenia um, at the, the workshops. And, um, I think that um, also workshops with Susanna Miller and Maria um, Plazola and follow up at Malanga's as well as Brigitte Winkler encourages socialization and offers those kind of opportunities post certain kinds of lessons and things. And, um, and so, and also I learned a lot about myself and I think that people uh, that um, dance tango have that opportunity and many people do um, tango is like a microcosm of the real world and you know other things I learned from doing tango is like tango is like um, life on the dance floor and life is like tango off the dance floor and um, you have an opportunity to see how you uh, get a better sense of how you interact with people and even though I started as an older adult learning tango, I started to realize, well, you know, I had other things I used to think about then all of a sudden I started, you know, I believe, and I don't follow this, like perhaps I could, and maybe someday I will, that if you dance with many different people, as many people as possible, you will probably become a better dancer and better dancer faster. I dance, I used to dance in a very restrictive way. We only 
when I first started dancing with only a small number of people. Now I've expanded that. I'm not the type of person that tries to dance with every single person where at an event, but I try to continually dance with more people than I've danced with. Why is that? Well, I've learned for, from the beginning that I'm shy, I'm reserved, and I think a lot about other people, maybe sometimes too much so. So I started, it started to dawn on me why I branched out a little bit more, not just for the desire to dance better, but I started to realize, you know, some people might think I'm a snob, but it's not more like the flip side. I'm thinking, I'm not sure I can give this woman a good dance. I've seen her dance. And I, you know, maybe if she dances with some of her favorites that I see her dancing with, and maybe if just the right music is on that I feel I can give my best dance, maybe I'll ask her. So this might not go in the heads of other people, but this is something that affects me. But if I see somebody that's really friendly and kind, and I get that sense that, you know, that they're op very open, I'll dance with them, even though I might see, okay, this is an instructor that I don't know or something like that, I'll dance with them. But generally, you know, I, I've learned these things about me. I don't even realize them before going into tango. I always knew I was quiet, but I, you know, I, but I didn't get a sense that I, I had do this kind of thinking that a lot of people, it's just like something that they don't experience at all. They either want to dance or they don't want to dance. And like people that are good, really good dancers, um, but I'm not necessarily that good, but with the perspective that I want to give somebody a good dance, I think, well, with this orchestra and this music, I might be able to give this person a good dance. And so I'll ask them to dance. But with this, even if she'll dance with me, I might not give her a good dance with this kind of music. So I'm not going to ask. Her. So. Um, these are these are things I know they might, might sound in some ways trite, but they're big to me. And these are things that I've learned through tango. And I also learned that I act that way in life in some situations, which didn't dawn on me until I took tango. So um, that's another thing. And um, uh, so those are some of the things that I've learned. Um, um, well, I mean, I could say that, you know, in, I've learned that it's important to keep your upper body really relaxed, you know, even while your legs are moving around and being aware if you're not, if it's not relaxed and you're not giving it, not being sensitive in the embrace to be, I mean, to be aware of that. And so there are things from a sort of a, a tech, a technique type of aspect that are also important um, that I've learned. Um, but generally, I think learning more about myself and, and how I interact with other people is, is one of the, the big lessons. And related to that is to accept myself, to accept myself. And so it's a life lesson that I think I've gotten a lot better you know, at um, that was derived through understanding um, and thinking about tango and enjoying tango. It led me to accept myself better and be more relaxed. So do you mean like you accepted this um, um, reserved side or something like the, yes yes and that well, yeah, well, just just for the just uh for the record i mean <laughs> you're one of the least reserved uh, guests i've had on this show so yeah you're very uh articulate well i, I appreciate that uh, tango is a passion and i think this uh, type of interview is really phenomenal. I think hopefully more people uh, will do this. Um, and so when I'm passionate about something, I'm more like I was when I was a kid. And I just yeah, let good. do yeah. it. Yeah, and yeah. I think that when things are important, and I don't worry about how I'm going to say something, I just say it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, uh, um, but in general, when it comes to other people, I'm very really concerned about their social space and how they feel. And you never really know what's in someone else's in my mind. And I, I really want to try to be kind. And, um, and so I think those, mm, those two issues, um, mm, to a certain extent, relate to my cautiousness and reserve in, in certain settings. But um, as I make more friends, I become more open and um, 
I do seek opportunities to expose myself and to uh, to many to more people and um, to relate to more people in many ways in, in simple ways like volunteering to help out to set up or or um, to close out a malanga you know the physical work or maybe collecting the money just things simple things like that in addition to whatever else I'm doing as you know as part of being a member of the community because to me tango offers so much to people if you have some time it's so hard not to give something to tango to give something back to help the community or to help groups and and so um that's a slight digression but i mean that's it's related to what tango has helped me to sort of come out of my shell a bit and i i try to continue to do that but maybe i'm taking baby steps but i keep on taking them yes well that's actually yeah. something uh that's uh Srini Vas uh, uh, told me. I think you, uh, you're you uh, friends, right? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, he told me he became um, more open and more extroverted due to tango. And honestly, I don't think this is, uh, I don't think this is a coincidence because I think this space is really uh, generally very suited for uh, people who are more on the introverted side. I mean, I'm, I'm just the same. Um, but uh, you, in a way, you feel safe to, um, to just be who you are. And you're also appreciated for who you are, in a sense. And uh, this might also be true in other environments, but I feel like Tango is, uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's, quite, a, it's quite a good uh, place to be for um, I think there are a lot of um, introverted people, a lot of, uh, you know, um, people in very technical jobs. That's also something I very, I saw a lot that there's a lot of engineers, a lot of uh, IT people, but there are, someone told me um, like there, there's two types of people here and they somehow they mingle very well. And it's it's like one of them, like the half of them are IT people, and the other uh, the other half is an artist. Um, and they're just, it's yeah. I mean, that's a bit of an uh, you know caricature of, of of reality, but still, I, I think it's uh, it's not surprising that this dance attracts other people than uh, uh, salsa or bachata or something. Um, and that's that's you know that that's great. I mean. Um, you know, it's good for people to to feel home where they wherever they feel home. So I I, I don't judge about uh, people who have a different character than I am. Uh, I do that that maybe prefer other dances or, or you know I don't know. But it, it's it's just an interesting thing. And what I also thought was interesting is what you said about that you like I always feel like I gain some new uh, at least one important new perspective from every conversation I have uh, and. Uh, what you said is this um, way, yeah, like you try to expand this social circle a bit every time. So, if, for example, you were saying if you're at an event, you don't necessarily try to dance with everyone, but you always try to add some new people to your uh, uh, repertoire, so to say. Uh, and I think you said something about that. I can't remember it exactly, so it's hard to paraphrase that, but. I think you said something like, um, yeah, but th th that was the entire point of, of the of the new insight I, I gained. But um, that that this is what the dancing is also about. That you share this with 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 those people, and everyone you dance with is different. And I mean that's also good for me because sometimes I also tend to become a bit elitist in one way or another. But then I also realize that uh, this dance is is different every with every person like you say so it's 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 uh i mean it, it, it doesn't mean you should be dancing with with literally everyone and some people are not compatible in, in styles or character or whatever but still good to to have an open uh, open mind with that you know so um, do you want to say something more about that or can i ask uh, ask another uh, oh please ask another question uh, okay okay um Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, I think this, this is the most important point left. Like, 
how did tango change your life or maybe put differently how did your life evolve with tango a uh, very good question um so i think there are a number of things that have evolved in my life to a large extent through tango and one might be um um uh, to better appreciate um, my family and to value my friends more. Um, it, and I can't explain precisely how tango did that or its influence, but I feel it. Um, I think um, tango sort of, continually helps me to bring other people in, into who I am and into my more innermost type of feelings and how to better communicate with others. It, it's helped me with communication and helped me to become, to open up and be friendlier, um, to let my feelings, my true feelings uh, emanate. So I would like to be friendly, but a lot of times I'm quiet and reserved because I'm thinking too much about the other people and how they're going to perceive it if I uh, appear to be too friendly too soon or something like that. Um, so, and I think, you know, Tango um, has, it challenges me to go to a better place myself and to be a better person. And I think it will continually do that. Um, I think... Um, I love tango, and I, I believe that people in general dance tango and are into tango because they love it. And um, when you love something, you sort of um, devote yourself to it, but it also changes your perspective and your time frame. What I mean by that is you might listen to music more, whether you're a DJ or not. You might buy new clothes, new clothes for tango. Um, you might, um, um, you might do other things. You might go on a business trip and you're busy and, um, but there's one night that's kind of free and instead of having necessarily dinner with a few colleagues that you, you know, you don't see that often, but you see from time to time, you find where this tango event is in the city. And you go there. And so it sort of changes, you know, changes uh, your life and the way and your perspective. And um, I also think that tango helped my life and help it evolve by making me healthier or helping me to become healthier through exercise and relaxing. Um, and it helps me to focus a little bit more on maintaining my health. And um, also, um, it, 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 my life evolves with tango by tango helping me to help myself evolve my life in ways that I prioritize. I might be focused more on what I dislike about things, what I like about things, what I like to learn. And I make choices, like choices with teachers, choices, choices of which malangas to go to. Um, focus and try to focus more on joy, actually being happy for me and having a good time for me, uh, as well as the partners. Um, and it might, mm, let's see, um, it might also let me be comfortable if I want to dance to certain orchestras at certain times or certain songs and not others. So it lets me sort of be free and not to feel like I'm there uh, I'm obligated, or just to feel relaxed uh, more. Um, I think, in general, tango helps me and probably other people prioritize their um, in, in life in general, um, and it's um, it's an effective way uh, to become closer to yourself. And I think I become more and more close to myself as time evolves. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with tango. 
and so I, I see my life evolving by, by being more self-reflective, more understanding, um, prioritizing better. Um, so as much as I might like tango, I might uh, not go to every single tango event that I have to travel to so that I come home, wash my clothes, go to the next event and, you know, and wash my clothes and go to the next event so that I can develop priorities and say, I like tango. I don't have to do tango all the time because there are other things I could be, uh, enjoy other people, but there are a lot of things that I like in tango. And so I think my life will keep on evolving in this, in these ways and other ways based on things that I like in tango. Yes, yes. Well, that's, yeah, that's just very interesting. Um, so here's an unprepared uh, question, but I think I generally tend to uh, focus a lot of the uh, on the positive sides of, of tango, but uh, it can also be uh, tough sometimes uh, when when you know when 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 you feel maybe excluded or something. Um, well, I don't know, maybe not necessarily socially excluded, but but mean when like when some people really don't want to dance with you and you feel frustrated or you just, I mean. Uh, so, so it, that, does this also influence your life or, or do you know how to deal with these things or, or maybe you don't suffer from that at all? I mean, it's also possible, but can you maybe only if you want, of course, but can you maybe say something about that side? Because life is always, you know, it's always um, a bit of a, yeah, I don't, yeah. No, that's a very good question. Now, when I first started, I would take, um, all rejection, meaning uh, non-responsiveness to the cabaseo as personal, as personally. And then I realized uh, it's not necessarily personal. Um, there's, could, it, you really don't know why somebody doesn't want to dance with you. It could be because they don't like the way you dance. They don't like the way you look. They don't like that music or that song or that tanda that's coming up. Maybe they'll dance with you later. You don't know why. So at first I took it personally, and then I started to think, well, you really don't know why. I don't take it positively. What I would say is to focus more on the negative for a little bit, I am very comfortable with somebody um, going like this and saying, no, making very clear. What, I'm, what I personally don't like so much, but I still try not to take it personally, is when somebody closes their eyes or they, or they quickly look away like you have a disease or something. Um, and uh, I don't, so that that disturbs me. And also if it's an encuentro or a marathon, it's uh, where it's at least it's role balance and it's fairly traditional and the encuentro it should be very traditional. And if there are other leaders that come right up close to somebody right in your line of view as you're, you're just ready to cabaseo, uh, and they cabaseo the person and they and the person, you know, it maybe feels obligated or wants to dance with them, but you lose that opportunity. You know, that's like in life, you lose a lot of opportunities that way. You know, somebody's going slowly, slowly ahead of you in a car, very slowly, and then they speed up, the light changes red and you get stuck. Okay, those things happen. You yeah, know. those things so happen. So I try, yeah, yeah. right. So the same with Tango. Right, and it's the same thing in tango, but there's a, um, and so uh, I sometimes I'm not, I used to be very disturbed when people didn't, when leaders didn't navigate well, and they'd go in and out of a lane, or, you know, they would hold up and there's so much space in front of them. Now, I, you know, I, I I don't like it, but I realize you know some people might be compromised. But the people that are just not focused on the Rhonda and everyone else, it does disturb me. Uh, what I would say, just like you know somebody speeding down, you know, going thirty miles an hour faster than the rest of the traffic, going weaving in and out, or something like that, or somebody cutting right in front of you, no signal in a car. It's just you know same uh, same kind of thing. But you know, I've learned to be a good navigator, and the safety of the partner is, is the key for me, and so it doesn't bother me as much. Um, so um, there are some things that you know that disturb me, like a high price of of malangas. Not for me personally. In general, I can afford it, but I see that some people are restricted, in, you know, particularly nowadays because of 
pricing in some places. So that disturbs me. It might motivate me to do something else, but I certainly still DJ at practicas for free at many practicas. So, um, but in terms of any more negatives, I mean, I really can't come up, I could come up with a lot of positives, um, you know, things that I like about tango. Um, uh, um, but negatives, um, I have a lot of po more positive, but I don't, I can't really think of any, any negatives that are certainly prevalent. Um, there always could be minor things, you know, if a sound system is not working that well or things like that, but um, I can't think of anything else unless you want to, unless you have some suggestions to ask me about particular negatives. Um, I can only think more about more positives. Yes. Well, maybe one thing like, um... What do you think about uh, like like uh, I I feel like in in but that's not just in tango that's everywhere like people can be a bit um, you know they tend to organize in cliques and ah. you know I feel like like um, but you know that happens everywhere so it's not really specific to tango it's just that you know sometimes it's um, it's more obvious in, in tango because uh, you just see all these social things happening on one night and maybe if you're uh, on, on the like the the top of the food chain you don't really notice but where whenever you're somewhere new and nobody knows you you always see these uh you know i, I hope i don't influence you too much with this uh question no, no. but uh, it's, no, no. Uh, I, I see the same kinds of things so um do i like clickishness uh, I would say in general, no, but there's an issue with respect to the extent to which there's clickiness. So if the click only dances with everyone else in the click, and there are a number of other people that can't get any dances, I, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like that. Um, I would say though, that going to a number of events I experienced the following with a number of people and myself as well. So often, let's say if it's an encuentro or a marathon and there are multiple malangas in, in a few days and practicas and that type of thing, that generally in, in particular in the first malanga, I might dance predominantly with the people that I know, because I haven't seen them in a while, they yeah. might not be in my local area. And I think that's the same, you know, for other people, for many other people too. And then I'll dance with other people in my sort of reserve way, not asking everyone, but more people, you know, more people. Um, but when I go to a Malanga and um, there might be, I'm not a clickish person, so, I might be, if you think of sort of a Venn diagram image, you know, there might be uh, a click and maybe in some Malangas, groups that I'm, pe of people that I'm more close with, they overlap with the click, with the click, the click group, but I'm not one of the clickers. But, and so I might, in those situations, um, I might get a few dances with the click, click group and, uh, branch out with other people. But I have found uh, interesting situations. Um, I'll just mention a couple related to that. And one is that um, I've been to, let's say, another big city, which is pretty well known for being clickish by some people. And I might go to one of the Malangas there. I might go to more than one, but one of them I would go to them and I'd say, well, the long is like this. And I would get, you know, some good dances, maybe six or seven tandas in the course of the night. Not a lot, but six. And what I found was I was getting them all from people that were visiting, usually from Europe or from other cities. And they were good, really good dancers. And they weren't getting dances either. Okay. And so mm, that bothers me. I'm, you know, wondering why is this, you know, and you know. And speaking to some other people about this that are really good dancers, such as instructors, and they have difficulty getting dances there. Okay, so that is, 
I don't like that. I, it's not just for me. I just, I don't like that. If everyone, you know, is some really amazing performance dancer, which they're not, and then maybe I can see that they want to have a, a night where they're just dancing with each other. Now, uh, when I went to Buenos Aires the first time, this is very brief. So I went to El Beso. And the first night I went to El Beso, it was Thursday night. And I wasn't that good a dancer, you know, um, and I hardly got any tandas. And I, and, um, but then I learned that a lot of instructors would go there on Thursday nights because they were busy on other nights. And, and that's why they were getting so many, all these some women wanted to dance with them. But then I went there on Saturday night and I got a, a good number of dances, a good number of tandas. And so, you know, you need to know a place really well because every night is different and there could be clicks, but you know, the click might not be there all the time, but um, I don't like really strong clicks where people just stay with the click um, because if they're really good dancers, I'm not suggesting they need to give a charity dance to everyone, but they might be able to break out of it a bit, you know, with people that they can see can dance all right, and maybe they won't be able to, you know, have the soup to nuts, all the different kinds of crazy movements that they like, but they can have a good connection to the music and dance. Uh, maybe they could dance one tanda like that in a night, but uh, some places you can't find that, and that I don't like, okay? Yeah, and we yeah. find, you know, and so I agree with you, yeah. But it's a tricky topic because, like you said, when you go to an encuentro, you know, a lot of people are going, you probably focus on wanting to dance with them first, especially if right. you live, um, well, I guess the same happens here in Europe, but especially if in, in, in the US with all this distance between cities and then you, 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 you just don't see some people very often and you really right. want to dance with them if you go to the yeah. event. And that, that's actually the same thing that might be happening uh, in one of these cities. The people are just busy dancing with their own dancers. and. You know, some some cities where where people are like Amsterdam, where people are are, are um, you know, especially from outsiders, they're they're um, seen as cliquish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that might be true, but on the other hand, it also may be true to someone who comes in and just isn't such a good dancer, mm -hmm. and he doesn't really do much to improve. Like mm -hmm. some people just don't want to dance with someone like that, uh, not necessarily male, but uh, I said he, but it doesn't matter what, what gender, of course, but just a dancer. So it's very, it's very difficult and it's a very tricky topic to talk about, but I just like to bring it up every once in a while because I feel like I really want to focus on what's positive about tango. But I'm currently living, uh, I'm, I'm not dancing a lot and um, I, I, I'm very much focused on my in, many individual activities in life. And mm -hmm. I feel like it's just something I don't really miss, even though it's also part of what makes tango exciting is that you, you have this game of, of uh, you know, trying and, and, and refusal. And um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's just uh, I feel like there's a lot of uh, stuff going on between people and and but the good thing is that that it's also at the same time it also can be very harmonious even though some people might not dance with each other they're still you know people mm -hmm. are generally just having a good time yes. and and so there's a lot of things to say about the positives but um, yeah I just wanted to hear your opinion uh, about this uh, totally uh, unplanned but uh, yeah, just so that uh, nobody thinks I, I, I never ever think about uh, the, 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 the tough side of tango, but that's it's as with life, you know, everything you do has these two sides, like there's always, you know, it's never, it's never perfect. So um, I, I guess what's part of what's being addict, what's addictive about tango is that it's this risk game. Uh, I think I, I discussed that with someone. I, I just remember now that I discussed it with someone on this on this uh, series. Yes, um, you know, I agree with all that. I think it's important. I also think uh, sort of um, in some some sense of broader way or, or macro way is that, well, I was in Amsterdam once. It was a long time ago. And um, you know, I mean, my general impression was uh, life is in a fast pace, very similar to when I was lived in New York City, but the people were very friendly, at least in the pubs, but this is well before I started dancing a tango. 
And so you can have very friendly people in a very friendly community. Um, and, you know, maybe they might not want to dance with people that haven't been learning, uh, you know, and it's going to be disturbing and that's very understandable. And, but if the people are continually learning in Amsterdam in the local areas, that's an effective community. Um, and the people are friendly. And um, in, but they might, you know, have their mm, preferences of who they want to dance with, strong preferences. That's okay. And then in other communities, people might be extremely friendly. They might not be as good dancers, but they dance with everyone. And that's an effective community. But it depends what you mean by effective community and what the community is. And so I think sometimes when you look at the negatives, you get a, it can help you get a broader sense of, about what's going on as well. And you have to be honest, it's like life and there are pluses and minuses and there are different ways of, of not just um, dealing with it, but trying to understand and trying to understand if you're a stranger or the outsider, you know, that it's not necessarily, you know, based upon just some type of strong discriminatory or prejudice sense. It's, the, you know, the way the community is and try to understand it and could be a good community. And it's just not the right time for you to enjoy the most dances in that community. You know, that's, and it's like life, you know, in a lot of other ways. Yeah, and, and it's always important to remember your perspective is just your perspective out of many. I mean, it's it's just your way of looking at it and the reality might actually be different than what you think. And that's something to remember for everything. That's, that's uh, it's, uh, I think I saw this quote once, like, um, uh, people don't have ideas, ideas have people. <laughs> and uh, I found it very liberating because um, a lot of people are so uh, stubborn about their, their, their thoughts, about their ideology, about their way of looking at things, but it's just your perspective. And sometimes you're not even, you know, it's not even a conscious decision to think about something the way you do. It can also just be something that you don't even have much influence on but then that's why it's good to to like kind of step over this 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 conception and and uh, preconception and, and 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 open your mind a bit so well uh, i think we have already agreed uh, that we wanted to uh, talk a second time yeah, and there's a lot of uh, yes yes there's a lot of uh, things left to uh, talk about and uh, yeah i hope maybe today um also gave you some, uh, maybe even some more of ideas of what you want to talk about. Uh, what, I, what I think was interesting is that there was a lot of overlap between the questions. Um, that some of my questions, when you ask question number one, so to say, you're already uh, asking, uh, replying to number two and three in a sense. But that's not bad because it's, it's all tied in together in a way. Yeah. It's, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just... Uh, very joyful to be uh, discussing these things, uh, you know, the, the way the way you feel them and the way you look at them. And uh, yes, uh, I loved uh, your your take on things. And uh, well, I'm looking forward to hearing more uh, next time. Same here. I really appreciate the interview. I'm looking forward to next time too. Thank you so much, Lucas. Thank you. See you again. See you again. Bye for now. Bye.